This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So, um, I'd just like to welcome um, Professor Justine Snyder from the University of Nottingham, um, who is going to talk about the Inside Out of Mind project. Um, I think it's a really fascinating um, project, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. So, Thank you, Michael. You've, you've heard it all before. First of all, I want to apologise for not being with you all day. I was very disappointed that I couldn't manage that, but I was on an interview panel this morning, so I had to come down from Nottingham after that. So I don't really know who's here, but I, if you could just give me a show of hands if you're an arts practitioner in the room. Okay. Are there any carers in the room, paid carers, professional or lay carers of people with dementia? Um, and what about researchers? Are there researchers in the room? Okay, lovely. Well, this was written really for a mixed <coughs> audience of researchers and arts practitioners, but because I'm a researcher myself, um, I, I guess there's a bit of bias, so please don't hesitate to ask any questions um, about anything I might not make clear. Basically, this is a story of how we turned a fairly conventional piece of research commissioned by the Department of Health to look into the role of healthcare assistants working in hospitals. And healthcare assistants are the unqualified personnel who make up about 50% of the hands-on carers in the NHS. And the description really covers many of the people working in social care as well, who, who are not qualified as nurses. Um, but what we did was we wanted to find out about the workforce and we were asking questions like what motivates staff, um, what obstacles to good care do they face, what do they find stressful and how do they cope, what appears to promote staff well-being, and what are the implications of all of these findings for person-centered care of people people with dementia, which as you know is the gold standard. So we are in the dementia context, but we're not looking at individuals with dementia, we're looking at carers. And I think what's really distinctive about this whole project is that it addresses how it feels to be a carer and looks at this in quite some depth. So I employed three researchers, you see Joanne Kezia and Simon here. Simon at the time already had his PhD in, in um, education, but he'd taken an ethnographic approach, which meant that he'd done participant observation. Uh, Kesey had a master's degree, and Joanne a master's in uh, op occupational psychology, I think. Um, but they were largely naive to the clinical settings um, that they went into. So they were very game. They did the training, they put on the uniforms, and they went and worked for 50% of their time for about six months as healthcare assistants on the wards. And they did everything. Uh, that all the other healthcare assistants did, and they went home and wrote about it in the other half of their paid week. Um, and this is an example of the sorts of records that they kept. They had an observation in one column, and then very often, in a second column alongside, there would be a reflection about that observation. And then those observations and reflections were subsequently analyzed, drawn out, mapped, and clustered into themes. So you can see how bathing leads to reflection on why we like some patients more than others and what's that what's that got to do with attachment and how do how are people affected then when that attachment is broken we also conducted focus groups with groups of healthcare assistants and where we asked more general themes and a few focus groups with carers um, relatives of people with dementia who've been in hospital. And this is this kind of thing that came out of the focus groups, general, general attitudes, the culture of the ward, an agreed kind of position on some of these questions. What, what does it take to be a dementia carer? The reflections exemplify really well why participant observation can be so revelatory. Because it enables a person to become completely immersed in an environment, but a person who's not inured to that environment, someone who hasn't gone native and begun to accept everything as normal. And here's one of the comments that Kezia made, you know, it makes me sad to see a new patient, not just because they're on a ward, which is really, a dementia ward is kind of the end of the line for many of these people. You don't go in there, not everyone ends up in one of these places, of course, but uh, they are usually very ill indeed when, when they're cared for in that kind of a setting but also because they arrive here without any transition. And nobody ever really thought about inducting a patient to a dementia ward, but Kezia could see that this was something that was really lacking in the environment in, in which she was working. So I think this might be one of our hot links. Uh, no, it's not. It just calls for the 
me to prove to you that we actually did produce academic publications. And there was a number of them. We published our report, and it's on the NIHR website. But we were left very dissatisfied at the end of that. And there were a number of reasons why we felt that we wanted to take this further. One is that we had actually about 600 pages, about 500,000 words of uh, of writing, of field notes that the researchers had made, if you add all the interview transcripts and things as well. And that could never ever be conveyed in, in a two and a half thousand word article for a journal or even in a 40,000 word report to our funders. And it would have taken a lifetime to publish it all piecemeal and I didn't really want to spend my life doing that. Um, so we wanted to get more of it out there. Um, the academic publication process is not only slow, it's also pretty ineffective at making any change happen in, in the health service or the social care service. And we all really wanted, having immersed ourselves in these settings, we really wanted to uh, facilitate improvements as far as we could. And finally, we felt we had a, an obligation to the people who allowed <coughs> us into their lives for all those months, the patients and their relatives, but particularly the healthcare care assistants who had with whom we had literally shared the burden of care for all that time. And they had um, been brave enough to expose their lives to us, and we felt we owed them a great deal. And we knew very well that they were not going to be... Um, reading uh, peer-reviewed publications, the sort that, uh, as academics, we are incentivized to produce. So I used our um, dissemination budget. Instead of sending the, conf the uh, researchers to conferences, <laughs> we commissioned a play from uh, a lovely playwright, Tanya Myers, who is also an actress, and who, um, who immediately um, engaged with the material, partly, I think, because, like me, she had been a healthcare assistant in her early 20s. And unlike me, she had cared for her mother-in-law in, in the um, later stages of dementia. So Tanya could understand what we were getting at. And she and I had a, a shared experience of regretting some of the rather insensitive care that we delivered when we were carers because of our ignorance and lack of training and support. So Tanya took the field notes and she wrote a beautiful script, a full-length 90-minute script, and she drew out the themes that we'd also identified in our report, but which are conveyed so much better when they're embodied on the stage in characters. And the characters of the healthcare assistants and nurses are constructed, they're composites from the people that we, we knew very well from our field notes, whereas the characters of people with dementia are really fictional because we were not observing the patients with dementia. Some of them are stereotypes, some of them are very creative characterizations, but they are, n they are not true to the field notes. So this is where what we're doing kind of departs from what some people call ethnodrama or, or verbatim theater, which is when you actually try to be very, very true to uh, the researchers' field notes. We gave Tanya complete poetic license, artistic license, and this is what she produced. Um, one of the other uh, devices that I want to draw to your attention is that the actors playing healthcare assistants doubled as patients with dementia. And the very fact of seeing these people change their roles into one and, and, and back again in the course of the play just speaks volumes to the audience. So the issues like managing the emotional climate, the stresses of working directly with families, the importance of team identity, the relationships between individuals on the ward, all of those come out beautifully in Tanya's script. It doesn't just portray idealized care on stage. There's quite a lot about it that health service managers find difficult to take. And we think it's important to put that on stage to challenge people and to raise issues in a way that you can do when it's depersonalized. You're not talking about a family with a complaint here. You're talking about an artistic portrayal of less than perfect care. And that is a wonderful tool for learning, for training, for raising awareness. And the play also deals with the major issues of, of end-of-life care in dementia in a very sensitive way, it looks at staff burnout and anger um, and all of the, the spin-offs from working in those stressful situations. So we were really excited to um, 
uh, be able to find the resources to produce a little workshop about the play. That's where the photographs were taken from. With just a week's rehearsal and a skeleton cast, really no props, so we borrowed a, a room at uh, Nottingham Playhouse Theatre and, um, and performed excerpts from the play to an invited audience of arts practitioners and health managers in, in the region. And we really wanted their feedback. They gave us the thumbs up to go forward with the full production. And it took us another two years to raise the funding, rehearse and, and, and book in a full production. Um, so when we moved forward, about, about Christmas time 2012, um, Shona Powell, who's the director of the Lakeside Arts Centre at Nottingham, which is a commercial public arts centre on the campus of the university, Shona said, look, we've got a fortnight free in June, do you want it? And we said yes, we took the plunge. And between December and June, uh, we got the funding together to, um, to put the show together. And it was very, very exciting for me in about... Uh, May when the, the crew came together for the first time and we began to see the maquettes that uh, Nettie Scriven had made of the, of the stage um, and the set which, uh, which Tanya had envisaged and it was really very moving to see that the attention um, to detail and the commitment of all of the cast and crew to this play because of course I scarcely need to tell you all of our lives are touched by dementia. Everyone was working with their hearts in this whole enterprise and everyone went more than the extra mile. I want to try and show you a little bit of the, um, of the recording that was made from a static camera in the stalls just to give you a flavour of what this looks like on stage. Well, you can go home and look at this at Blinks um, of live on, you know, from your own machines. Maybe it won't be held up quite so badly. But um, as you can see, it's quite an ambitious production. Lots of lighting, lots of projection, lots of set. It's a very expensive one to tour. Um, and it's very, very creative. The central character is a, a hero of the French Resistance who revisits his youth. Um, and uh, we filled the theatre in Lakeside uh, many times over. My um, ambition with this show was to particularly sh show it to people who had um, participated in the research and so we were very very keen to get lots of healthcare assistants and nurses into the theatre and thanks to the support of their employers and the Royal College of Nursing we were able to um, engage about 1,250 uh, local nurses and healthcare assistants. So eight performances were reserved exclusively for the NHS. And since we had, um, uh, since we had them there for daytime performances, we also scrabbled around and got funding to provide educational workshops and lunch and tea and so forth. I agree that refreshments are a really important part of these experiences. Um, and so the day-long learning events then were um, facilitated by my colleagues at the University of Nottingham who mainly gave their time for free and we had a small grant from the Arts Council to bring the cast who'd been performing in the morning to join us in the workshops in the afternoon so each workshop had an actor in it as well as a facilitator and that was some space to reflect on the emotional impact of dementia care and to learn from each other about dementia care approaches. Um, that was a really satisfying experience. We also uh, well, it was very important for us that it uh, gained proper critical review. And this comment by Francois Matarasso, the, the former chair of the Arts Council in East Midlands, is one that um, was enormously important to us because it, um, it challenges the idea that some in the arts world reserve for, uh, for this kind of activity challenges the, the, the criticism that it might be called instrumentalised art. We, we were trying very, very hard to steer away from that by giving the playwright and the and director complete freedom. 
Um, and Francois's opinion here, what it achieves in developing understanding of dementia and dementia services, this play achieves because it is excellent theatre. So with that in hand and other letters of support, uh, we went to the Arts Council East Midlands. Oh, we went to the National Arts Council Strategic Touring Fund. And one of the, um, one of the things that we, we used, let me see if I can find this somewhere else, is a video that, no, I've lost it. Well, maybe I can go to it here. This video, which I hope it doesn't drag too much, it's the feedback from the people who participated in the workshops. get the gist anyway <laughs> we had um, yeah really good feedback from these people and these healthcare Brilliant. assistants appreciated it surprising I laughed and cried They got it spot on, she says. <laughs> so, um, there we go. That was Gemma. Arts Council Strategic Touring Fund, cut a long story short, and a lot of anxious waiting, um, said yes to our application. So uh, the interviews I was at this morning were to recruit the project manager, production manager in some terms. Uh, the live tour is likely to go to five cities, Canterbury, Exeter, Warwick, Leicester, Derby and Nottingham. And in the course of that live tour, which starts for, uh, on the 16th of February next year and lasts for six weeks, um, in the course of that tour, we're also going to be making a, a digital film that's suitable for transmission in cinemas, so um, a kind of National Theatre Live approach, uh, and that will be going out to the Cinema Arts Network, um, whose venues are shown on this map, so we will get national, indeed, I think one of those dots is in Scotland, um, maybe even international uh, coverage, um, and certainly one of them is in Northern Ireland, so, and one's in Wales, so yes. UK coverage for, uh, for the show in, in 20, uh, 2015. Um, I see that my title is Reflections on, uh, on the, arts and, uh, the Arts and Health. I suppose the, the main reflection that I've gained from this, or the learning I've gained from this, is the, important of, so the importance of striving for excellence, um, which is easy to say, but it's harder to do when something, um, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the expression that was used in the original version of the script is one that's often uh, spoken in healthcare assistant circles, but which the managers never want to hear. The healthcare assistants sometimes say, we're just shit shovelers. And naturally that made its way into the dialogue. Um, and I think it's the only thing we censored <laughs> because it is so uh, demeaning really. Uh, in the message that it gives. We show that fact, we illustrate the, the way that doctors uh, on, come onto the ward and ignore the healthcare assistant, even though the healthcare assistant knows more about the patient than anybody else. Um, but uh, we're, we're a bit cautious with the, with the terminology. Um, the second thing that is really important, and it emerged from a little bit I heard this afternoon, is, is finding ways to bridge the silos of the arts and health. And you may have had discussions about this, but we haven't got our shared language, we haven't got shared evaluation instruments, and we haven't got shared criteria of quality, actually. Uh, in that sense, you know, what we're doing collectively here is really exciting because it's kind of a young science. And I hope that you know, many of you will carry on uh, in your sterling work and learn lots and publish it and share it so that we can all benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
consciousness. It's a very appropriate and vital talk. Obviously, you can talk about creative ways of disseminating uh, research. That's, that's a fantastic example, I think, of that. It's also appropriate because I used to work in the Lakeside. Oh, so I thank you for mentioning <laughs> that. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions, so does anyone want to, to start the ball rolling? Really? To the play, we had um, a number of carers whom we invited to the, to the first workshop, um, and a couple of them came to the to the full production, uh, and they went both ways. Some carers said it's too strong for me. I, you know, I wish you well. I can see the point, but I, I'm just not ready for this. Yes, yeah. Um, the target audience for us is, is the NHS and social care workers, mm -hmm. really. And I, and I think that, I mean, this can have a general audience. If Tanya were here, she would, she would immediately say that her vision is, this, is for this to, to, to find a general audience. Um, but the people who it really speaks to are the ones who've lived that reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we've got a theatre full of healthcare assistants, um, we get responses like, well, I didn't need to come to theatre because I, I do that every day. And we hear people saying, well, I've never been to the theatre before, but if this is what it's about, I'm coming again. And others saying, well, well, it's them up there who should see this because why are we paid so little if we do so much? You know, it's really exciting. We always have an audience discussion when we have the NHS in the theatre. Mm. So do you get the NHS Absolutely. Um, we get the very senior managers to come and chair the audience discussion. So they show by their presence their commitment to those staff. And also they can take the flight when people start talking about their wages. Yeah. <laughs> Have there been already in this early stage of things? Has there been any changes that people have gone back to going back to work, even just on yeah, a yeah. personal level for them? Um, our sound um, our sound designer found himself in an accident in emergency with a, with a minor complaint um, several months later and he said the staff were talking about the play mm -hmm. and he overheard them talking and said, well, I, I was involved in that. Yeah. <laughs> so it does stick. I think what's really important is that groups of staff have a shared experience. I would always advocate coming with a team or coming with a full, you know, a, a ward team or with a, a, a clinical team because uh, in the best learning tradition, people then have a shared experience that they can reflect on over time and their reflections on it likely to change over time. I can't vouch for any improvements in practice, but you know, <laughs> it's very, very hard. It's very hard to change practice because the whole organisation, the whole system is against you. Um, and I think if, if you can start by changing hearts and minds and, and, and then amplifying that, that's, that's the way to go about it. I just ask a quick question. Um, I was just wondering, because obviously, I mean, representing experience of dementia in, you know, in an artistic form is it's always going to be a contentious um, issue, I think. And I just wonder whether you've had any kind of negative responses or any, um, or any kind of critical responses to, to the play. The, it was interesting because the actors um, learned from the healthcare assistants in the course of the workshop. So over the two week run, their acting improved because they were getting instant feedback notes from, from the healthcare assistants uh, and they, they commented on that. Um, the, I mean, Tanya chose a, an excellent company, so we, I personally heard nothing but praise for the acting and the portrayal of individuals with dementia. There was quite a lot of research went into it, and, and as I said, many people had close relatives with whom they'd lived that experience. But then, of course, you know, I'm not the person that the really critical comments would come to necessarily, and you might be able to offer me advice on how we could tap into those. The, crit the criticisms that we got from evaluating the workshops were all about catering. I <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, 
any further questions? So. I just wondered whether or not you'd take it to a, a wider audience. Am I right? You said it's for healthcare professionals. Oh. I just wondered if you were any plans about taking it to a wider audience to just to promote that understanding. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a huge scope for public awareness raising. We use the programme in the Canterbury event um, to uh, educate people about dementia. So in addition to the usual programme notes, so there's lists of useful contacts, what is dementia, that kind of thing. Um, and when it tours to the six regional theatres, it would be absolutely a, a general touring drama yeah. production with a general, general audience. Yes. We're still looking for a London venue, so if you know any producers who might be interested, <laughs> be very happy to talk to them. Be the next curious incident of the dog in the night time if you play it well enough. Well, just getting the steam and keeps it all. Oh, do I want to see a play about autism? That's no, a good I point. I haven't compared them. With do them. I want to see a play about dementia? It's a play about dementia care, you see, and that's dementia what makes care. it more universal because I think we all, you know, whether we have direct care or not, in this day and age, we all touched by the responsibilities of dementia care. And you said there's humour in it. That's always good. It's very funny. It's quite farcical in places, yeah. And and very moving. I mean, the people in tears at every performance, not just the actors. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Um, from the time that you spent with the healthcare assistants, how much was it because of how they were delivering the care um, versus the structure they had to work with it in terms of the number of patients they had to look after? Mm. in one uh, shift mm. um, and the number of hours of working for shift and the breaks they had that was actually that that was affecting the quality of care they were mm. giving rather than them not being aware of what they were supposed to be doing oh, yeah. with someone with dementia is that something that came as a theme? Very much so and in fact Kezia who was um, one of the original healthcare assistants went on to do her PhD. She just finished her PhD mm. and to do that she went and did more participant observation in two high quality care homes that were recommended, one in, in Buffalo, New York, I should tell you, I should tell you. <laughs> one in the United States and one in the UK, and, um, and so she really got under the skin of healthcare assistance in both those countries, and it was clearly a trade-off between the demands of the organisation and the needs of the patients. Generally people knew what they wanted to be doing. Although how they how they managed it emotionally, you know, did vary according to the individual. So it wasn't all entirely structural pressures. Mm -hmm. You know, people can choose to um, to prioritise the structural pr pressures over the patients as individuals, or they can choose to prioritise the patients as individuals. Yeah. And have you found an institution where they found the right balance? We found some very good institutions. Yeah, excellent ones. Certainly mm -hmm. ones that one could recommend. And it's got a lot to do with the number, the length of the shift. Mm -hmm. Eight hour shifts, no more than eight hour shifts. A lot of them are twelve hour shifts, in fact. So you, you know, after eight hours, it doesn't matter what you think ought to happen. You really don't care anymore. You're just getting through the time that remains. Um, so shorter shifts and higher uh, staff ratios. Yeah, it's all got costs. I was just going to add on to what you just said there. That I think that um, raising standards <coughs> is going to be inextricably linked to places that look after people with dementia that only have a, a limit on the number of beds. Mm -hmm. I think that places with very high numbers of beds mm -hmm. are the places that are most likely to slip away from the standards that you would really want. You mean under one roof? Because some of the, yeah, the yeah, multiples, as they might be called, people, uh, organisations have very good care homes, but lots of them. Would that, would that be a lot of beds? I'm, I'm talking about, um, well, possibly chains of, of nursing homes, but if they have sort of like 50 or 60 beds in one place, you know, I think there's a higher possibility that the, the sort of individualised care mm -hmm. is not going to be quite up to the mark. And yeah, so, it depends yeah. on the software. Okay. I think that's great. Awesome. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much.